Now we stand with me, please, as we open up Jeremiah. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 48. This is one text we'll look at before we get into our study of Habakkuk. In many ways, this is kind of a lead-in to Habakkuk, even though I didn't originally plan it to be so, but there's a lot of things to think about as we get into Habakkuk. But Jeremiah chapter 48, we're going to read verse 42. And this is in the... um, great description of the judgment of Moab. Verse 42, Jeremiah 48. Moab shall be destroyed and be no longer a people because he magnified himself against the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. As I mentioned, this is kind of a lead into Habakkuk. Habakkuk looks ahead <clears throat> to the time when Judah would be invaded by the Chaldeans, the Babylonian people. And though God uses the Chaldeans to judge Judah, which is his covenant people, the Chaldeans will not go unpunished. They too are guilty before God. They're guilty before God in their disobedience, as we read in Jeremiah 25, verse 12. Then after 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, declares the Lord, making the land an everlasting waste. So this brings up the need to discuss something very important in our day. Very important. It's been talked about a lot over the recent years. And increasingly so in many respects. But first I want to say a little something about labels. So I am a Calvinist. I'm a Reformed Baptist. I'm a general equity theonomist. I'm a post-millennialist. I'm a covenant theology, lordship, salvation guy, and amongst other positions theologically. Now labels, like those, can be very helpful They can help understand what people believe in kind of a quick fashion. But there's a major caution that we need to hear with about the use of labels that needs to be mentioned. It's looking from the perspective of not the person who would hold to particular label themselves, whether you view that as good or bad, whatever, and what they believe. But it's, the caution is for the person who uses a label on someone else. If you label, if you say that someone is a post-millennialist, and I just use that as just an example. If you say that someone is a post-millennialist, then you need to let that person explain their position before you label them that. And you need to, re- to represent them fairly. This is important because there are many labels, many labels heaped on people by others that attribute the wrong position on them. They wrongly attribute a position upon them. They misrepresent them. This is really apparent when it comes to discussions like what this sermon is about today, Christian nationalism and Christendom. The further need here to be careful with is, is because if I say that, I, that, that such and such a person is a Christian nationalist, but what I say about their belief in that area is actually wrong, it's not what they actually believe, then what have I just done? I have bore, borne false witness about them, haven't I? I have said something about them that is not true, right? So we need to be very careful about us labeling other people. Along with this is the crucial test in all things to test whether belief positions, belief systems, uh, 
are biblical or not. So to test what you hear, to test what people believe and how they articulate that, to test them against the Bible, whether they're biblical or not, which leads me to define these terms and to further expound on what this text says and means so as to lay out these issues that are very important in our day and to lay them out biblically for you. But before I do that, it's really important to just note a couple of pieces of this text. Look at this text, this verse, and ask a couple of foundational questions. And these will run through all of what we say. Number one, Moab is not Israel, are they? No. They are not God's chosen nation. They're not God's covenant people. Number two, Moab was a nation, right? A nation is made up of people, collectively, together, right? So note those. They're not Israel, not God's chosen nation, God's, not God's covenant people, and they are a nation. Then ask these questions. Are they addressed as a nation in this text? Were they being judged? Why were they being judged? Those are fundamental questions that run through a very important topic. So first, what is Christian nationalism? What is it not? What is Christian nationalism not? Right? This helps in defining some things sometimes, to define it in the negative. So first, I'll illustrate with something that uh, Michael Horton said. And I respect Michael Horton in many, many ways. He's a godly man. I think he's a Christian man. But yet I think he's horribly wrong in what he says here. And I think it's very detrimental to the church. And I'll refute what he says all the way through this sermon. So take note of that throughout. He says this, quote, The problem with Christian nationalism is not that some Christians are taking a biblical idea too seriously, but that they are confusing America with Israel under the Old Covenant. From a biblical perspective, it's actually heretical. It confuses the law with the gospel. End quote. That's a very strong statement. But this is a major false claim about those like myself who would expound the concept, whether, whether I like to be called a Christian nationalist or not, I really don't like the term at all in many ways. But it's a major false claim against those like myself who would expound the concept of Christian nationalism biblically. America is not Israel. And that should be an easy thing for us. It should be an easy thing for us. America is not Israel. Just like Moab was not Israel. And yet, Moab was still held accountable before God as a people, as a nation, right? It says it in this text. And many other places in the Bible give the same illustrations and listen to why they're judged. Verse 35 in chapter 48 of Jeremiah. And I will bring to an end in Moab, declares the Lord, him who offers sacrifice in the high place and makes offerings to his God. Verse 7, because you, this is why they're judged, because you trusted in your works and in your treasures. Verses 29 through 30, we have heard of the pride of Moab. He is very proud of his loftiness, his pride, and his arrogance, and the haughtiness of his heart. I know his insolence, declares the Lord. His boasts are false. His deeds are false. America and Moab are not and were not God's chosen covenant people who were specifically given the Mosaic law from God and who the Messiah would come from. Moab, America, and any other nation other than Israel are not Israel. 
It was only Israel and no other nation in all of human history in that specific context. So just because of those differences, it does not mean that any other nation cannot and should not be a Christian nation. Actually, our text very clearly shows all nations are supposed to be nations that honor God and their obedience to his law as a societal people. One verse clearly shows that. If they don't, if a nation doesn't, and they are intentionally not a Christian nation to obey the one true and living God, then they will be judged in one degree or another. And this is where a balanced understanding of covenants is very important. There is a difference between, one, God's covenant with Israel, and two, God's covenant with the true Israel, which is the church, wherever they are, both individually and collectively. And there's a difference between those two. And thirdly, people making covenant with God from their end, from their perspective, in an effort to honor and obey Him. Coming and saying, God, I want to honor you. I am making covenant with you. By the Spirit of God to honor you in this area, whether it's the home, whether it's society, or any other sphere in life that involves multiple people collectively. So first, I just mentioned the difference between Israel and a place like America. America or any other nation other than Israel in the Old Covenant are not the people that God chose to be his people in that exact context for that exact purpose. It's just Israel. And if we understood that, then we would start to have more of a balanced understanding when it comes to a topic like we talk about today. There were specific realities that made Old Old Testament Israel very unique and like no other. But if that's all that we connect this subject matter to, then we will dive headfirst into the sand like Michael Horton does in conflating very important distinctions. Secondly, in the new covenant, God's covenant with his people, the true Israel, his church, exists wherever they are which is present both in an individual sense and in a collective sense. And this goes to the spiritual depth of the matter. In the individual sense, it is in Christ alone that we are God's true covenant keepers, where by grace alone we are His prized possessions, one by one. And by the Spirit we faithfully honor Him in the rest of our life, and we're sanctified in that whole process. So in that individual life, we are then called to live under His Lordship, where we obey His law in every area of life we live in. And again, we grow in that. It's not like we're perfect by any means. We should, that should be an obvious as well. But we grow in living under His Lordship and the reality and practicality of that. And then those individuals gather in different areas of life where they congregate to form groups like families, churches, societies, communities. And when these gatherings happen, they are as a people, as a collective people, they are called to do the same thing, live under the Lordship of Christ, where they obey His law in all those areas of life. And from God's perspective... God has made a covenant with those people through and by the finished work of Christ alone. So that's their position. That's their reality. And from that, from God's covenant and His perspective, we then, from our perspective, should and ought to live a life glorifying God and obeying Him in all areas of life. But if we stop at these first two points, we risk over-spiritualizing at the neglect and detriment of this life 
and what we're called to do in this life. And if we separate this, if we over-spiritualize this and say it's just the spiritual reality and that's it. Like 1 Peter says, we're a holy nation, a royal priesthood. It's driving at the spiritual reality, at the depth of that. If we just stay there, we over-spiritualize the Word of God and we create an imbalance. It says it's all about the spiritual and the material is really nothing. The, really, the material life really doesn't mean anything. Our jobs there are really limited in what God calls us to do, even if that. And it creates a big imbalance. And then it's actually a form of Gnosticism where we separate the spiritual with the material. And that's dangerous. That's detrimental to the life of the church. So we need to go further. And thirdly, because... All of what, it was, what I was saying was true, that, that God just had Israel as his covenant people, but also that is a shadow of him bringing the church out to be his church, his body, his people, in a spiritual aspect. All of that's true for those who are his. Then on the other side of the perspective, we, from our vantage point, come into covenant with God. And that's very different. We intentionally come to God and say that we will honor and obey Him in the way that He calls us to live as a collective body, whether it's a man and a woman in marriage, saying that they will order their home by His standards with a biblical balance of the law and the gospel, not only for themselves, but for their kids, for all their family around them. They come to God and say, I will honor you. I come into covenant with you. And that's a different covenant than from God's perspective. But it is very, very vital that we have this distinction. So this is from the point of view of the people. Like when the Puritans came to America to establish a Christian society, a nation And they did so in their departure from the tyranny that they dealt with in England. So they came to this this land and said, God, we are a people that we come to honor you, to set up a society that honors you. And they as a people made a covenant with God. And this is the basis for a nation that is a Christian nation, which can be any nation. Why do we think America is so special? So as we look at those three three issues, the first shouldn't even come into question. We should have a much better balance when it comes to these things. Especially if you're a scholar like Michael Horton. It poses a danger with what he says. It really does. Because when Christians hear those statements, those comments, without a biblical understanding, and we have such a biblical illiteracy in our nation, it's really been a a damage to the church. So when Christians hear these comments, without a biblical understanding of the subject themselves, then they can be taken away by those comments and start believing them. And many people do. Oh, he's, he knows what he's talking about. So I'm going to listen to him without even really asking crucial questions. And this, again, is a great hindrance to true obedience to Christ. What he calls us to do in this world, in this life. Similarly related to this, Christian nationalism and Christendom is not the new apostolic reformation and Pentecostal prophecy movement with America having some special blessing where God has a special plan for this country that's largely in the prophetic sense. And even many people go and say America is prophesied about in the Bible. So terminology used with this is the quote-unquote, seven mandate, mountain mandate, or the talk of dominion that distorts these biblical concepts. Dominion is a good thing, but if we distort it biblically, 
it turns into a bad thing. And this is where it does. In this movement of this new apostolic reformation, which is, which is not a reformation at all. It's not apostolic and it's not new. And I'm not the first one to say that. And so they distort and largely reject, in many ways, the necessary work of grace to bring the change that is needed in the human life to affect societal change. Largely, this movement denies the work of Christ, the work of grace in the heart of regeneration and from then on, in many ways. They distort the Holy Spirit and who He is and what He does. And there's much that sounds right with this movement, but the foundation is quite off. There's really no foundation underneath it in many respects. Many of the politicians have been connected to this NAR movement or have been influenced by it. Many of the quote-unquote evangelicals that you've seen in the, in the Oval Office in recent years are from this unbiblical movement that has had an unbiblical understanding of what a Christian nation entails and how one is established. And so there is a version that is wrong. That's a Christian nation version that is wrong. But people have been bought into that. And many secular news outlets, that's one of them that they focus on to try to dismantle this idea of Christian nationalism, to smear it. But that's not what it is in the first place. Uh, This is mostly the movement that Africa is thankfully rejecting right now. They don't want the Western influence. Africa, in many ways, is largely building up their nations themselves with a proper desire to honor God according to His law, according to His word. And Joel Saint, Nate, uh, Joel Saint, Luke Saint, and, and another guy from Mid Atlantic Reformation Society went just just went to the Democratic Republic of Congo, and they saw this. The president is a Christian. He he has a great desire for the Congo, the D- Democratic Republic of Congo, to be a Christian nation. Same with Uganda. Same with other places. They don't want the massive unbiblical influence that the West has had on Amer- on, on Africa. They don't want it. And it's great to see that. This is a very interesting situation because they're, because here in America, there is a massive resistance from many, many in the professing church to Christian nationalism. Such a pushback. It's crazy. Which is probably coming from the many misunderstandings. Many different versions that aren't biblical at all. And while there's a growing, and this happens while there's a growing number of African nations who want to be Christian nations the right way. That's very interesting. It's an indictment on the West in many ways. Another example of what Christian national, nationalism is not is the abhorrent version that Ted Cruz represents that I mentioned a couple weeks ago. He said about, the, uh, about Uganda and homosexuality, quote, this Uganda law is horrific and wrong. Any law criminalizing homosexuality or imposing the death, t- death penalty for aggravated homosexuality is grotesque and an abomination. All civilized nations should join together in condemning this human rights abuse, end quote. This is an example of an abhorrent version of Christian nationalism, where he says that all civilized nations should join together in condemning this human rights abuse. He says that while he says at the same time, and he says this repeatedly, that he wants to restore America to its heritage of being a Christian nation. How do those two... Is there any harmony in those two? They contradict each other. They do. They contradict each other. So yeah, those two statements contradict each other. Because when he says that all civilized nations should join together in condemning this human rights abuse, that is actually going against what God has said. And when that is done, that will not restore 
a nation, any nation, to being a Christian nation, because that's not Christian. That is Christless. And it is, it is, it's, it's not a conservatism that conserves what is good and true at all. It's not good and true. Lastly, Christian nationalism and Christendom is, is not a, an ecclesiocracy with or without persecution and forced imposition. So ecclesiocracy, church rule, okay? A biblical view of Christian nationalism and Christendom does not advocate that the church should run the state as a political entity or that the church should rule the nation as its political power. There is a difference between the ministry of the word and the ministry of the sword. There are two ministries ordained by God, used for God's purposes, but they're two different. Those are two separate jurisdictions with different offices that are authoritative. And only so, they're only authoritative when they are in accordance with the word of God. Both have an obligation to obey God, but they are separate spheres, separate parts of society with separate functions and purposes. The church is to be the conscience of the state, to hold the state accountable to obey God, to do what is right according to him. But it is not to be the state. But that doesn't mean a pastor cannot run for a political office. But if that happens, as it is in Oklahoma with a good and godly man, Dusty Devers, who's running for Senate in that state, then that person will be a pastor in the church and a political official as senator or governor or county official or whatever. And those are separate offices. Even when they're held by the same person, they're separate offices. That also doesn't mean that that pastor cannot have his theology affect his political work. Because again, everyone's beliefs will affect what they do. There is no neutrality in any respect, in any, li- any part of life. There is no escaping that, no matter who you are and what you do. Also in this area, there would be no persecution or forced forceful imposing on every citizen who is not a Christian so as to force them to be a Christian. That's not how people come to Christ. That is not how people come to be a Christian. And this is different than the establishment of just laws from God's law based on his law that would enforce punishment in a civil law and in a criminal sense. That's different. This would be necessary because governmental authorities are to punish evil. That's the ministry of the sword. But that does not equate to persecution or forceful imposition, imposing forcefully upon citizens. So what is Christian nationalism biblically defined? And what's the difference between that and Christendom? Simply put, Christian nationalism is when a nation, from their point of view, intentionally declares and works toward obeying God and His law in how their society is structured and how it functions as a society. It's a collective people living under the Lordship of Christ. They're consciously living under His Lordship as a civil collective people. That's one nation or one county or one community. Christendom takes that same thing further and is about multiple nations during the same time of history, which could continue over generations. And I just saw an email from a good, um, good organization in Gary North defines Christendom this way. Christendom is a civilization, the kingdom of God in history, 
that is governed in every area and every nook and cranny by God. A society whose lawfully anointed rulers govern in terms of God's revealed law. In this view, God is not in retirement or on vacation. He is a king who has delegated to his officers the authority to exercise command. Because that's their job. That's what God has ordained them to do. Go read Romans 13 and many other places in Scripture. That's their job. They are a deacon of God, a servant of God, to do what God has called them to do, according to his word. So in Christendom, it's a more of a collective multiplication of nations. And it highlights more of the action, not just the identity, but more of the action of what they do, which is theology applied to all of life, especially in the civil area of life. So every nation has the obligation. Get that. Every nation has the obligation to obey and honor the king of the world, Jesus Christ. Remember, this, is really, uh, this, this really has nothing to do with any connection to Israel and the Old Covenant in many respects because they were solely unique. This also doesn't mean that every single person in that nation, wherever it is, is going to be a genuine Christian for it to be a Christian nation. It's not it either. Nor does it mean that just because people may obey God in a civil outward way, in a societal way, by obeying the civil laws that are in accordance with the general principles of His law, that does not mean that they are saved by their good works at all. Which is another uh, an ignorant statement of Michael Horton and that Christian nationalism confuses the law with the gospel. That's a a legalism that's heaped up on. That's a false claim. It's not what it is. Given this, this subject of Christian nationalism demands that we recognize and that we can recognize important distinctions, very important distinctions, which drive to understanding the law and the gospel, both of them in their differences, in their relations, and in their uses. And I've harped on this a lot because we are not getting it in America. And this is very basic. What is the law? What is the gospel? What are they used for? How are they used? What's their relation with each other? And this is where all the misunderstandings of this topic come from, I think. And this is a major problem for the church with its recent results on our nation. Still in America, about 60% of Americans say that they're Christian. How does that make sense with what our nation looks like? These are problems, big problems that we need to deal with. We often read from Romans 16, 25 to 27 in our benediction, which says this. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but now has been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. Do you think this gospel that's mentioned here, which is to be made known to all nations, do you think that brings about the obedience of faith? When the Spirit works through that gospel to bring life to that dead sinner, do you think the obedience of faith will come? Yes. And it's an obedience that is not just strictly personal in your own personal life, in your own personal bubble, in your own little secret life at home or wherever. It's supposed to shape society. It's supposed to influence society for the glory of God. Because since out of salvation from the gospel comes a people 
individually and then collectively as they come together, a people who are zealous for good works. And is that something that God produces? Is that something that God does? Yes. So again, I ask the question, how in the world does that make sense when you look out at our nation? Do we really see people zealous for good works? What are these good works? How are they defined? Who defines them? Where do we go for that standard? We have to stop thinking so individualistic and be so influenced by this retreatist pietism that just shrinks back into our own personal little lives. We have to stop thinking and, and getting, getting uh, caught up in these misunderstandings that are so many today as we give in to them. Think more biblically about them. Examine them. Test them according to the scriptures. People, ideology, which is beliefs, doctrines, and law make up a society, don't they? They make up a county. You make up a nation. That is the combination that will sway a people one way toward disobedience, which is where we're at largely, or another way toward obedience, which is where we're not at largely as a people. So understanding the law and the gospel is so crucial when it comes to this. It's so crucial. If God's law, and this is one of the uses of it, If God's law is supposed to restrain wickedness in a society, then every Christian, every single one of us, if you are in Christ, truly, every single one of us should want their nation to be a Christian nation. Why? Because it will be governed by the law of God. The law of God is good. The law of God is for the sinner to restrain their wickedness and so that the next may come, that they see their sin in the mirror of God's law and be emptied of themselves so that the gospel could come rushing in to fill that void of what they desperately need. So in a society, no law should be made or established by man, but only that which faithfully reflects God's civil law and his word. That is for our use to restrain sin in a society. And right now, we're not restraining sin. That is for our own use, which further gives God's ordained opportunity for them to look into that mirror of the law and come to know their sin before a holy and righteous God, do you not want that for people? If you do, then you should want a Christian nation. And when that happens, when they see their sin before God, by the law, when that happens in a Christian nation that is actually existing, then the Christians that make up that nation, wherever they are and wherever that happens when the sinner sees their sin before that holy God, in the mirror of the law, wherever that happens, then that Christian will act upon that. Will act upon that. And what will they give them? What pathway will be cleared for them to be given something? you will then be able to present the gospel of salvation. So in a Christian nation, when we have a worldview that's functioning biblically and our laws are set up to reflect that, then Christians will take advantage of those opportunities to see souls come to Christ because they've been emptied by the law. It's restrained their sin, their wickedness in a civil way, and then they've seen it. They've seen their sin. They know it. And when that happens, here's your hope. Here's your life in Christ. Come to Christ and see that new life and honor Him in that new life. That's the pathway that we want. So there's the reasons why we should want a Christian nation. It gives way 
for God's grace alone to come and to work and for them to be covered with the righteousness of Christ. And when that happens, that will propel them by the Spirit, propel them forward on that path to live on. Which is what? Which is growing in obedience produced by the Spirit, causing them to obey God's law in all of life. Their life will be changed, and progressively so, every area of life will be changed. This is how the law and the gospel relate. But so much of the Christian community in our nation is ignorant of this. Unfortunately, it's a massive unfortunate. We're ignorant of this in one form or another, and boy, has this damaged not only the church, but our nation. And it is really blocking us from true progress. And that true progress starts with repentance. We need to repent. 1 Timothy 1, 8 through 11 draws this relation out, saying, Now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, for the sexually immoral, for men who practice, homo- practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. You see the connection, the relation? You cannot separate the law and the gospel, but we have. And boy, has it done damage. Desiring a Christian nation and working toward that goal, no matter what nation we're in, should be obvious to every Christian. It will be obvious to us if we understand what the law is used for and what the gospel is used for. We want to be evangelistic and to be so in every area of life, right? Without hindrance, persecution. And this is how you do it. But what the current situation shows in our nation is that because of the ignorance, because of our ignorance, Our evangelistic witness is sorely lacking. Remember, souls are at stake. And do you have a burden for them? Souls are at stake. So to say that Christian nationalism, as biblically described today, to say that it it neglects the gospel and puts too much emphasis on the law, is to show a detrimental ignorance that is everywhere and is growing. This ignorance is an indictment on the church and part of God's judgment on, the, on this nation. God's judgment starts with the household of God, with the church, meaning that he sanctifies his church in discipline and refinement, which brings repentance for those that are his. As we see what we've done, what we've had a part of, and or it purifies. He purifies the church in showing who is of God and who is not more clearly as time goes on. And as times get hard, there's a pressure. And what are we going to do? Through this clarity comes and soundness can grow by the grace of God. And we ought to be on our knees praying for this to happen. We ought to be gathering together to pray. What else do you want? What else do you want? A Christian nation or a pagan nation? Because it's one or the other. There is no in-between, no neutrality. It's one or the other. We used to be a Christian nation, though we've faded gradually to be quite nominal in name only throughout the last 100 years or so. But it is one or the other. And right now, I'd say we are not a Christian nation because we've shown in many years that we are an anti-Christian nation. We have magnified ourselves 
against God. Haven't we? And we're paying for it. You could put America in where Moab is mentioned. We have magnified ourselves against God, and we're paying for it. We're being judged. So what do we do? Where do we start? If we want a Christian nation, then our homes will reflect that. Because our homes, if you think about it, and there's many variables to this that I won't ultimately touch all of them, but our homes are a microcosm of a Christian nation. A microcosm is anything regarded as a representative, miniature version of a larger reality. Your home is a microcosm of a Christian nation, which is most seen, and I'd argue, only genuinely existing when the husband is the head who follows Christ and orders his home, whether they have kids at home or not, by God's law and gospel, which isn't a tyranny. If the head is disobedient and pagan in belief and action from an unregenerate heart, then those under him who may follow Christ themselves individually are like exiles in a pagan nation. So they have instructions of what they are to do. They are to build. They are to grow. They are to seek the welfare of that city. And a major one is being a witness to the one above them. So that hopefully they come to Christ and change that into a Christian nation, right? So there may be a remnant existing in a dispersion kind of sense, a scattered kind of sense. When the head come, but when the head comes to follow Christ, then a nation forms underneath him because he leads his people in the ways of God. This is reflective of the change that comes when an authority figure in their society comes to be saved and changes how he governs. As 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4 shows that when an authority figure comes to Christ, what then happens for the people underneath them? They live a godly and dignified life, peaceful and godly in every way. Why? Because that leader got saved. Their life changed. They started to do their job differently. So this microcosm concept can expand to a county being a Christian county, a state being a Christian state, and on to a nation being a Christian nation. But we wouldn't want to stop there, would we? We should want Christendom, where we pray that God brings many nations, many nations to follow Him during the same period of time of history, to see a great move of God And nations changing for the glory of God and expanding throughout all the world. But do we even have a category for that in our Christian community today? Do we even think that that is even possible? If we believe in the sovereignty of God, then we should know that this can happen. It's happened before. But we also struggle with the question of will it happen? Because so many of us have been taught that we lose down here. And everything will get increasingly worse. Though it seems quite bad now, and it is, Big time. I challenge you on that if you think that we lose down here and that it's supposed to get worse and worse and worse. It may for a time, and it has a lot worse in past history. But there's been great moves of God, progressively so, in many, many generations. This affects so much of how we look at this topic. It really does. And it's not a topic that's going away. We must deal with it. And deal with it biblically. Balanced. And then we must grow in our faithfulness and obeying the word of God out there. Starting with your self-government. You, individually, under the lordship of Christ. It starts there. What are you going to do about that? What are you going to do about this? 
and out from there and in your homes, whatever your homes looks like, and in our communities, in our counties, in our states, in our nation, in our world, this is an obligation. It is also not a burden, but a great desire for those who are, who are in Christ, and who love Christ. If you love me, you will do what? You will keep my commandments. What does that mean? And that relates heavily to this. So let us not forget that God uses the minority. If you're in Christ right now, we are the minority. Let's not forget he uses the minority and loves to do so, to change the majority. This has happened over and over and over in human history. Let's not forget our, who our God is. And that's what changes nations for the glory of Christ. Let us pray that God would use us. O oh, church, arise, right? O oh, church, arise to just sing songs and hang out in these four walls and go home and just kind of do whatever you want throughout the rest of your life. No. O oh, church, arise and be the people of God out there for the glory of God, to understand what's at stake and souls are at stake, and to pray that God would change this nation and that he would use you, each and every one of us, for that purpose. Let's pray.